Welcome to the Libido Lounge, where we focus on all things love, lust, and libido. We believe that fabulous sex is important to health as exercise and good food. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode on The Lounge. I'm your host, Dr. Diane, your libido expert. And I'm thrilled today to introduce you to a new friend of mine, Dr. Ray, who's a life and relationship coach, best-selling author. We're going to get into some really cool topics today, you guys, talking about trust and relationships and safety and really looking at even different techniques and actionable steps that you can use to get out of that kind of emotional amygdala hijacking scenario that sometimes happens to us as women, as humans in life. And we're going to talk about all of that and more today. So welcome, everybody, and big special welcome to you, Dr. Ray. Thank you for spending time with me today. I am happy to be here. And when you said the amygdala, I went, wow, I love the <laughs> conversations. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's real important, right? So maybe let's start there, because I think it's such an important topic, right, around so many times I find in my work that one of the things that breaks down the libido in relationship and in out of relationship, no matter where people are in their relationship journey, one of the things that can break down libido is feeling like feeling unsafe or feeling like they can't trust or just maybe their intuition, maybe somebody's intuition isn't being listened to anymore. And I, I tend to find that this can happen from big trauma events, which is very obvious to people, but also simple little micro traumas, like the, the way that Somebody says something to us and we get triggered or we take it the wrong way and we hold on to that. So can you like just you know, start our conversation maybe since you grabbed onto the word amygdala? Can you just- yes. Well, first <laughs> off, the, like, the, the purpose of the amygdala is to assess whether something is threatening or non-threatening. And once once it, it assesses that, it's very quickly that it gives you some type of appraisal like such as this can give us pleasure or it it runs and therefore there's this idea that it can hurt us and so where this could create challenges in our life and i know there might be if a man were to hear this hear this they would go well what what are you talking about this trust i never hit you before i don't i only yell if i drop something on my foot what does that even mean but if a couple is living together and every time she approaches a, a particular topic or wants to share her heart and the man reacts, he tries to fix it, he walks out or he's checked out, then in time, that experience itself can feel like I'm not safe here to be myself. And therefore, what that leads to is that this person that you might say the, you're living with your partner, the wife, in time is that She's in like in a way where she doesn't feel safe in her environment. So if her amygdala is hyper vigilant, if it's hyper vigilant, yes, I know logically it should not be, but if it's hyper vigilant, if her want to make love or be sexual would be equivalent to you say while she's in a tree and she just escaped a, tr- a, a, a tiger, if you were to say, Hey, honey, do you want to have a back massage? Hey, you know, you want to go out for ice cream? It's not going to happen because she's been in this total stress mode hiding in a tree. And so the key thing of like through meditation, coaching, and other techniques is to calm the nervous system. And the nervous system, of course, will calm down the amygdala so you can experience pleasure and joy again. But not just that, where this usually takes uh, working with a coach or therapist, if you have unhealed trauma, your amygdala is going off all the time, probably not for the best reasons. So it would be like where um, you you were abused as a child and um, anytime you uh, see a strong man or a big man, unconsciously it reminds you of your father who used to hit you. Well, imagine meeting a man for the first time who just happens to be big and he's friendly, but because he's just big, your amygdala says, run, hide. He's unsafe. I'm unsafe. And so we have to heal that. And that is what that leads to another conversation why people will self-sabotage because 
they're trying to protect themselves or they're afraid of something. So. And that could be a place to go next. I, I want to make sure to comment that I really appreciate your analogy of the tree example, right? Because I think it's so easy for us to hear things like, well, wh- how is this related? Why would something silly like my partner not taking out the trash when I asked them to, or my partner not calling, you know, when I'm five, when he said he's going to be five minutes or she said they were going to be five minutes late for work and they don't call and that's upsetting and that creates this trigger and that creates unsafety. And and why is that? So I think your tree example is so important that it's like, it might not be seem logical based upon where we are in our current understanding of, you know, of trauma, but we're still programmed like we're running from that tiger like we're running from that bear or like we had that you know that bigger trauma example that you gave so i think that's a really important thing and and i do like the idea of moving into this self-sabotage thing so so let's let's break this down because what can happen right is that people can get into these these situations where they do this they repeat the same patterns over and over and over again, right? So I'm curious if like that's part of what the self-sabotage you're seeing where it's like, okay, I get this trigger from my partner because they said something in a way and they didn't mean it, but I it really hurt my feelings or it really made me feel unsafe. And so then I react a certain way to protect myself. Libido shuts down, sex drive, connection, all the things. So is that sort of what you mean by self-sabotaging is almost that vicious cycle of response? Yes, absolutely. It's So most of the time, people think it's a conscious thing. But I, when I talk about this self-sabotaging, um, it's definitely an experience that's, say, separate from who you really are. In other words, it's like it's that darker, unhealed part of yourself leading the show. Okay. Uh, and I'll give you a real subtle one where I've seen women run. And that is when the man actually says, I love you. I love you. Because people who were closer to this woman when she was a little girl, they died. Um, people who said they love loved her betrayed her. So imagine she has this unhealed trauma. And it's not like it stops her from working or she's an alcoholic, but that she, they, people call her like the runaway bride, you know, when that, when like they, uh, a man is really serious, uh, to like be with her and it's just, she's afraid to commit. She's afraid that she can't make her own choices. She's afraid to be hurt again. Therefore she runs away. She self-sabotages. So how does somebody know if they self-sabotage? Because I, you know, there can be situations, right, where leaving is the right thing. And maybe there's people that, you know, some women I talk to, for example, say things to me like, oh, I'm a bad picker, right? Like I keep picking men that are just like, maybe they're dysfunctional in some sort of way, or maybe there's a value system align- misalignment or whatever it is. And so I'll hear women say things like, yeah, I just, I'm a bad picker. I just always pick bad men or the wrong men. So where, how does somebody begin to know then, okay, am I self-sabotaging me, myself, or is my intuition right? Or am I a bad picker and I need to switch my strategy? How do we break that down? So I'm going to make a generalization, which can trigger a lot of women listening to this, and I'm okay with that. It's not my intentions, but I recognize that more with women, and women hearing this might go, oh, but I've experienced that with boyfriends. So yes, it happens with men also, and that has taken personal responsibility. Like, so for example, I noticed that with a feminine person, whether it's a man or a woman, if it feels a certain way, that actually might be truth rather than being actually factual. So what I mean by that is if you feel you didn't do something wrong, you might never say I was wrong just because you feel that way. And I understand that. Why this is important to understand, it's this. So If you meet a guy and your story after each experience is he was a jerk, he was this way and so forth, and you're talking about all what was wrong with him and not how you participated, not what you learn and how you grew, then you are not using relationships in the best way they could be to be a reflection of how you can grow. So I don't think women just necessarily choose bad men. I think it's more of this. Number one, they don't they don't have clear boundaries and 
honor the red flags that come up on the first date or even the first couple text messages. You know that. You ignore their red flags because you don't trust yourself. There's that. Number two, maybe no one has taught you that there are healthy men and unhealthy men and that there's a healthy way to discern the, the difference. But if you've never met a healthy man, you might not know. That's why you work with a coach to develop like a love map of your values and so forth. So be clear with what you want. And then three, law of attraction. Uh, I believe that we attract what we are. And if even if it's not exactly like like where we um, <clears throat> attracted, uh, a, say, a narcissist, like you, you, you think, well, I'm a really loving pe- person. You know, I care about others. You know, why is it that I keep attracting narcissists? Well, you might be a vibrational match because you're a people pleaser. You're the perfect, perfect victim for the narcissist to perpetrate. So that's why what I mean by you might be a match or vibrationally, you'll attract that. But also if you always put out there, men are jerks and I'm not going to find one. Well, just like a person who is afraid that they're going to strike out before they go up there to hit. If he's saying to him or herself, I'm going to strike out, I suck, I'm going to strike out, more likely he or she will strike out. So we create those experiences and it takes personal responsibility for us to kind of go, yes, I ignored the red flags. Two, I really don't trust myself. Three, uh, I don't even know what a healthy relationship uh, is. And four, how do I uh, share my boundaries and my my deal breakers, you know, and, and how do I start trusting that, you know, I can walk away from unhealthy relationships and I can lean into healthy ones. So I appreciate all that. I'm going to ask a follow-up question and I just want to state that I'm sure there's people listening, as you said, I'm sure there's people that are listening that are triggered by this. So stay here because one of the things that that I do want to ask Dr. Ray that I'm going to ask in a few few moments is more around like, okay, well, how do we get ourselves out of this cycle? So stay around for that. Before we do that, one of my questions for you, Dr. Ray, is like, as I hear you say all these things, right? To me, there's like, if we're going to fundamentally boil out everything you said into one thing, I what I hear is it's time to be more personally empowered. And so my question for you is like, because my, my previous question was around, okay, well, if somebody is a bad picker, for example, and these things, then how do they know is it self-sabotage or I'm just a bad picker? And what I'm hearing in what you are saying, and I want to know if this is accurate, is that in many ways, it's it's almost like it's not an either or, but it's more around like if things are not working out, right, then the fundamental thing is that self-empowerment of flipping that mirror around and looking at ourselves and saying, okay, why am I stuck in these patterns? Why am I stuck here? Right. Would you say that's true or am I missing something with what you're saying? You are accurate. So when I was working on my dissertation, this is when I was single, I felt a little bit insecure because I was writing my dissertation and it was, I had to write it in a, like a, a clinical way in sight, which is not natural to me. And I was stressed and, but I was also single and I wanted to meet a woman. And it was strange how all three women, I met where I was physically attracted to. I kissed each one of them on the first date. So you think that, oh, it went really well. We had a lot of fun, but then they disappeared, all three of them. What's interesting is that one of them happened to work at Emperor's College in Santa Monica, and she was working as an intern. And I had, I remember her saying she was going to school there, but I didn't know which school. Well, I decided to get acupuncture and they set me up with her. So just imagine that awkwardness, but also it was really cool. Like of all the people that I got set up with, it's a person I went on a date with. I know some people listen to this and go, oh my God, I would have felt like this guy's a stalker, but hold on a second here. So she was cool. You know, like she was into spirituality, like all three women that I went out with that we had the same interests. So they were like people who were introspective, like you and I, Diane, we could talk about everything, you know, pretty openly. So um, I said, this is funny. She said, yes. I said, I was just curious, like, I have you don't have to answer, you know, like I said, but what happened? She said, honestly, she said, you were just a rebound person. She said, I, you know, I just broken up my boyfriend and she, she said that, and what actually happened, like a couple of days after we went out, like my cat was attacked by a dog and was almost killed. 
And so all my energy went to that. And I just decided to just kind of stay single and work on myself. She only went on one date with me. She didn't owe me uh, a response. It wasn't up to her to make me feel better because it was just one date. You know, I didn't feel necessarily gaslighted or anything like that. It was just more like, oh, I saw it as a, a such a great blessing of like, oh my God, most people never hear what happened. And so more and often, we just don't know, you know, because we don't talk to that person. But the thing was this, how I took responsibility for this and recognized like this was me, it was this. I really didn't want to get a relationship right now. I was feeling really insecure. I had one foot in, one foot out. All these women were the same way. Uncertainty. I attracted uncertainty. I attracted basically those who were not available. I wasn't available. I was so immersed in my dissertation. You know what? That's how I get sense of it. I, I love that. And what I also hear in that is this whole concept, right, is that we can turn any story into a story, right? Because you did find out the reason with that one woman, but it would have been so easy to like make some story in one's head around like, okay, well, none of these people like me because X, Y, and Z, or I'm not this, or all these like, I'm not enough, whatever the story is. And I think this, you know, this kind of goes back to this like self-empowerment thing, like in order to have more trust, in order to have more depth of connection, in order to have a better relationship physically, sexually, intimately with our partner and with ourselves, it comes down to releasing ourselves from those stories and the self-sabotage and everything we're talking about. So in your experience, where do people start? Because I think it's so true, right? When I see people in my community date and and I see this where people can go mad over, oh my gosh, I'm just not good enough. And this person doesn't like me for all these reasons. And it could be as simple as they're just have their own story. They just are getting back into date or whatever their story is. That has actually nothing to do with us, but we create our own self-deprecating story out of it. So where do people start? How do people break this cycle? Well, as you were sharing this right now, you know, what came up for me was just Here's a simple example in my book, All It Takes Is One, which is a simple, matter of fact, read that really breaks down consciousness in a really layman's way to understand, to understand how it shows up psychologically, emotionally, and, and how it can run your life. And so there is a, uh, it's called the return of love exercise. And you are to answer these questions as quickly as possible. It's kind of like free association. Love means blah, blah, blah. My family taught me that love meant blah, blah, blah. I received love when I blah, blah, blah. I didn't receive love when I blah, blah, blah. I needed my parents to love when I, I need to be loved when I, I wish I had been loved when I. So there's these questions and a response might mean you might come up with love equals pain to me. My family taught me that love has to be earned. I received love when I achieved good grades. I didn't receive love when I disagreed with my parents. I craved my parents' love when I was going to college. So you you start this simple technique is just to recognize like, oh my God, maybe I have a shitty idea about love and relationships. I never knew that. Maybe I have a really bad love map. So, so self-sabotaging, remember what I shared, is an unconscious mechanism within yourself to protect you. It is to avoid like pain and it is to move you more towards pleasure. Just remember that even if it screws things up after the fact, it's just understand that and it'll continue to operate that way until you feel good about love. You have a clear relationship with how you want to show up if you were to be in a relationship such as it's, it's got to be beyond the basics, such as I, I want a man who is handsome. We have great sex. He listens to me to, you know, it, it has to be this. I would, I would love a man to love my light and dark. Well, do you love your uh, light and dark also? Or you, re- you reject it? Uh, I want a man who can really hold space for emotions. How comfortable are you with feedback? Do you get defensive? So you have to become the version of what you expect. And that takes looking at yourself. It's going to take introspection no matter what. So a simple technique like that. I mean, this is not the cure all, this one exercise, but it's, it gives you an example that, which I've seen a, has worked. You, know, you get to the basics. What, what does love really mean to me? And do I experience love with or without a partner right now? 
I love it, pun intended. And I want to say that one of the things I say in my work is if you can't name it, you can't change it. And that's like what I hear and what you're, you know, you're saying is like one of the first simple things is like, actually understand what is going on, like name what is going on, your tendencies, your beliefs, all these things. And once you actually start breaking them down and say, wow, like you're saying, if you believe fundamentally on a subconscious level that love is pain, well, there is the initial, you know, problem to change. And then so in your in your book, all it takes is one, which will have links for you guys for all of Dr. Ray's works and his book and everything he's uh, talking about today. We'll have all of that in the show notes. In your book, do you then talk to people about kind of action steps from there? And and where do you tend to go in your work after, say, they've seen it and they've seen some of those stories and seen what's what's really limiting them from the love they want? Well, there's a different approach with my book and what I do with clients who say are coaching with, with me for maybe eight sessions. I'll talk about those clients who are working with me for just eight, eight sessions, let's just imagine that they're ready to date or they think they're ready to date, but they come to me and they still haven't healed a heartbreak. They still have issues with how their parents' uh, relationship ended in a bad divorce. So just imagine the first four sessions might be healing a trauma, uh, the person recognizing that that wasn't love, that was more manipulation, whatever came up for them. So they're clear, Okay. The next four sessions, like five, six, and seven, might look like this. So now that you know what you want, how would you show up and be, and how do you practice that every day, such as I want to be more open or friendly? Well, then you practice that and use an action by going to the grocery stores, okay? So it's kind of like what you said. How do you, does that, how do you uh, infuse that so a person becomes that? It's when they start dating or having experiences, they have a coach to talk to where the, the client might say, oh my God, I felt that same feeling I had when I was with my ex-husband. Like, wow, that's still there. Yes, great. So it's not like they're going to for sure end up with a partner, but now they're able to kind of create a, a new understanding of themselves of how they show up in relationships so they feel more secure and confident. So that's like a process I might work with, with if someone's like single and wants to start dating someone. Now in my book, it actually gets into more peeling like the onion apart and where you get into like the deep hidden beliefs that are controlling your life. So my my goal is to help people uh, discover what that hidden belief is and to shift it. So there is reframing in my book so you can start living and being that way. You could be your own mantra. Uh, as far as even more examples, that's actually going to go into uh, book number two as a follow-up to this book, that's going to be more now that you're healed, what does that spiritual, healthy partnership look like? That's book number two. And you'll see also at the very end of the book, it talks about these qualities of these people. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And I think it says a lot around this, this actually starting to become the person that you really want to be around, okay, well, if you want to attract somebody with XYZ qualities then where do you need to be and who do you need to be? And I, and I love it too, because I think so many times we get stuck, people get stuck around this like mantra or affirmation around like, okay, I am confident, I am love, I am all these these mantras versus like, oh, I'm actually going to go to the grocery store like you suggested, and I'm actually going to live my mantra in real time so that in time, we truly start becoming that because we're not just saying it, we're actually practicing it every day, Right. So it's so beautiful. I, and I know we're running out of time here, but before we go, a couple of things. One, and and I'm going to ask you a question about just what we want to leave people with. So don't go anywhere, everybody. But before we get on to that, uh, what sort of, I know you have a free giveaway for everybody that we're going to put into the, the show notes here. It's your Relationship Roadmap Course Guidebook. So can you tell us a little bit about that? So the Rapid Relationship Rescue Masterclass has videos as cheat uh, a cheat sheet, but it basically takes you through experience where you break down your belief system about relationships. Very similarly to like how we just did in this podcast, but you just, you're going to be in your, your home and, and, and where you create this sacred container for yourself. So you can kind of peel back like those patterns and beliefs that don't serve you. So that's one thing I offer for free. And that's something I'll give you. And then the other thing, do you want to mention my book? 
Um, so it's it's all it takes is one, right? That book. Yeah, it's yeah. The the full title is all it takes is one. Drop your one big hidden belief and master your life. And I'll give you a link for that also. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a a lot of actually psychologists, therapists, and coaches have bought the book. Like we're talking about thousands because including my girlfriend who's a coach, she she keeps giving them to her clients not because she's trying to support me, but she's she likes it because it's like a really simple manual of like, hey, this will support you while we're working together. And it looks like it's very accessible, like very yes. obtainable. You get through the content fairly quickly. You can apply it. You don't get lost in details that aren't important. It looks like very just accessible to people as far as actionable steps. Well, I love the Amazon reviews. The Amazon yeah. reviews. So uh, I like Joe Dispenza. I know you do, okay. do too. But when I saw his reviews, I thought, like, God, I hope I get reviews like that. To be honest, when I became a bestseller, that was the most exciting thing for me. It, yeah. it wasn't like validation, like, now I'm worthy. It's more like, because when you write something, you really don't know how the public is going to respond to it. Yeah. And he responded to this exactly what was it, what I intended. That is, this is a simple guidebook that really opened me up, that I was able to have a, a benefit right away to where people are praising the the quick breakthroughs. Perfect. And then if we're going to leave everybody with one final thing, right? One final, besides the obvious, go get your book, get this, you know, get these downloadable guides and start doing this stuff. Besides the obvious, one actionable step right now around something that can help with self stopping self-sabotage, I can help them get back into more connection either with themselves and or their partner. What would what would you break it down to one thing if you had to? Sure. So you, I, in a way, maybe didn't completely answer some of your questions about the, how do you know what is self-sabotage? So I am going to piggyback off of that. So I consider anything that is a, like if you have a negative thought about yourself or a person or a situation that in your body, in that moment, you're going to probably feel some resistance, maybe anger, maybe pain, and so forth. What would it be like if you were to ask yourself these questions in those moments? Number one, is this true? Number two, who do I, be who do I become or how do I act when I have this thought? Number three, what would I be? How would I become if I didn't have these thoughts? You've probably heard Byron. That's kind of like a little Byron Katie stuff. It's just yeah. that. Yeah. Just exactly. start with that because you're going to probably say it's not true. You're going to probably point out a behavior that you don't like. And of course, if you didn't have that thought, you probably would be maybe getting your nails done. You would be taking a walk. You'd be laughing. You'd be enjoying life. Yeah. Life is defined by the questions we ask ourselves. So. Yes. I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being here. Just as a reminder to everybody listening this year of 2024, we are doing a promo at the end of the year where if you guys, when you guys rate and review and download the episodes, whoever gets the most downloads, the most ratings, the most reviews, we will invite them back at the end of the year for a super duper deep dive to really pick your their brain. So I would love to have Dr. Ray back. So please do download this show, share it with your friends. And thank you again for being here, everybody. Dr. Diane signing off, always reminding you to stay classy, stay sexy, and always be a little badassy.